Welcome to By Mouth, bringing classic novels to sonic life in their essence. The year, 1872. The setting, the port of Makassar on the island of Sulawesi in the Dutch East Indies, present day Indonesia. A sharply dressed young man in his 30s stumbles onto an empty jetty. His tropical whites, blood-stained down the front, he glances around frantically. Spying at Jetty's end, a red light, he scrambles towards it. Grabbing the rail, he's lifting his leg over it when Captain Lingard, a British skipper in his 50s, appears. Ah, yo! The captain drops his shore bag and approaches, smiling. Willems quietly retracts his leg. Now where did you spring from, my boy, eh? Been hiding, have we? Speak out, boy. You didn't come here to scare me half to death for fun, did you? <laughs> the captain warmly clasps his arms around Willems, who remains facing forward to hide the bloodstains. We remember that scene, don't we, eh? What were you then, all of 15? Why, I'd know that backside of yours anywhere I would. Your English wasn't so good back then, as I remember. I said, you ran away from the big ship that sailed this morning, didn't you? You looked at me like a starved cat. Me won't stop here, you said. He'll get money home no good. <laughs> I looked at you hard, real hard, remember? Then I says, how old are you, son? Fifteen, you say. Well, there's not much of you for fifteen. You just stared back at me with the hungriest eyes I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Now look at you. Hoodig's trusted second. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were hopeless as a seaman. Hopeless. I soon found that out. I even offered to send you home, remember? You begged me to stay. You wrote me that letter in that lovely hand of yours. By then, your English was perfect. You were always good with figures, so I made you useful, didn't I? You developed beautifully, my boy, beautifully. You trading while I made out-of-the-way trips to <laughs> out-of-the-way places. When you asked to throw in with Hudig, I admit I was a little sore, but still, I was proud. Such a clever young fellow. And to think I found you on this very jetty, not much more than skin and bone. Now look at you. You know more about island trading than I do. Yes. By the long face, you've barely said a word. Why, only this morning Hudig asked me, have you found out where the captain gets all that rubber, eh, Willems? No, Mr. Hudig, not yet, I said. Well, try harder, he says. I've been trading with that old fox for 30 years and I've yet to figure out how he gets all that rubber. What's this? Blood? Not mine. Uh, another fellow's. Yeah? My brother-in-law's. Your brother-in-law's? I had a, a run of bad luck, see. Uh, cards. Cards? That, and that was combined with the, uh, the failure of a small speculation I had undertaken. Speculation? You? At the same time, there was uh, an unexpected demand for money from my wife's family. But surely you could turn to Hudig. Why, he trusts you implicitly. Well, you see, almost before I was aware of it myself, I had uh, veered off the path. For one solitary moment, I strayed. But I do possess the courage to wade bravely through the mud. I do, if there be no other road. No other road? I committed myself to restitution, you see, and I devoted myself to the, the duty of not being found out. Found out? Good Lord! A few days ago was my 30th birthday. I had nearly enough saved to pay it back. A few days more and there'd be nothing to suspect. But this afternoon, when I came back from lunch, Hudig's other secretary, Mr. Vink, he's always been jealous. He jumps up from his desk and he buries his head in the safe. I knew then that the game was up. For the last time, I passed through the little green door into the great man's inner sanctum. When I left, beneath Vink's pointy little ears was the tiniest hint of a smile. Well, I must have been mad. That's it, mad. Anyway, pretty soon I found myself in the garden before my house. Who digs wedding gift to us, you know? At that point, my past was so utterly gone, I was surprised to find the house still standing, neat and tidy in the sunshine. I thought, I must tell my wife. She'll cry, she'll be frightened, but she will surely stand by me. I'd have to console her, of course, get her ready to go, to leave. We would have to leave. But do you know what she said? She said, oh, you great man. Her voice was barely above a whisper. Oh, you great man. You think I'm going to starve with you? With you? Oof. That's when her brother, her layabout, money-grubbing brother came in. 
There on his ugly face was the same smile that Vink had. They plotted together. You go boast somewhere else and starve somewhere else, the brother says to me. Then my wife, my own wife, she goes and stands next to him. <laughs> Can you imagine? A half-caste to whom I'd given everything and she stands next to him. Him! Well, well... The next thing you know, I'm standing over the brother and he's bleeding from his nose and mouth. And my wife is shouting, this house is mine, this house is mine! Well, at that point, I just ran and ran until I felt planks under my feet and saw this red light here. The end of the road. One step more and... Well, well, well. I've heard a great deal, a great deal. You are no saint, Willems. I'll tell you that. No saint. And you've not been overwise either. I'm not throwing stones, mind you, but I'm not going to mince matters either. Never could, never could. I can understand Vink. He was jealous of Hoodie's trust in me. But the brother, he licked my boots. And you no doubt did your best to cram your boot down the fellow's throat. No man likes that, my boy. I was forever giving his lot money. Always a hand in my pocket. Just so. They asked themselves where all that was coming from and concluded it was safer to throw you overboard. After all, Hoodie is a greater man than than you, and they have a claim on him also. On Hudig? What do you mean? Why, well, you're not going to pretend you didn't know your wife was Hudig's daughter. Come now, you can't be serious. Huh. I thought there was, but no. I never guessed. My dear boy, steady now. Pull yourself together. Yes. Did you really think Hudig was marrying you off and giving you a house and I don't know what else out of love for you? I served him well, through thick and thin. No matter what work, what the risk, I was always there. You know Hudig, you know what he's like. Most respectable ladies knew the father well. <laughs> Best thing for a young man. Settled down, glad to hear the things arranged, recognition of valuable services. What an arse I was. Of course he knew the father well. God, let me go, I say. Let me go. I shall kill that. You want to kill? Hell, do you? You lunatic! Uh, be still! Be still! The two men struggle fiercely, with the captain forcing Willems towards the rail. Just when the captain seems unable to restrain Willems much longer. All right, all right! Don't break my back over this infernal rail. I'll be still. At last, you're reasonable. What on earth made you fly out like that? The captain leads Willems back to the jetty's end, and holding him with one hand, fumbles for his whistle with the other. Almost directly over the water comes an answer. My boat will be here directly. Think what you're going to do. I sail tonight. What is there for me to do? Except one thing. Now look here. I picked you up as a boy and considered myself responsible for you, in a way. You took your life into your own hands those many years ago, but still. Look, I will make it right with Hoodick. Go back to your wife. Don't abandon her. I haven't abandoned her, don't you see? She's abandoned me! As to going back to walk among men who only yesterday were ready to crawl before me and then have to endure their looks of pity or their smiles. I'd rather hide from them at the bottom of the sea. Whose fault is it now? Whose? Captain, if you leave me here on this jetty, you might as well just cut my throat. I shall never return to that place alive, wife or no wife. Don't you try to frighten me, Willems. I should tell you to go and drown yourself and be done with you, but I won't. We are responsible for one another. I'm almost ashamed, but I can understand your dirty pride. I can. A light from a lantern can be seen approaching from the water. Here's my boat. The captain picks up his shore bag and makes for a nearby gangway. His hand on the rope, he stops, turns back, and stares long and hard at Willems. Then, impulsively, the captain waves the young man over. Come, my boy, come. I didn't turn from you then, and I shall not today. Sir, I... I'm taking you to Sambia. It's up that river of mine that people talk so much about but know so little. I've found an entrance in. I'm the only trader. You'll see. Yes, sir. Our tale continues two weeks later at Almeyer's Trading Post, a remote jungle compound on the island of Sambia. The main house, which includes a decent-sized veranda with table and chairs, a hammock, and a birdcage, is fronted by a spacious courtyard. A gate separates the courtyard from a jetty, which leads to the river. Encircling the compound on three sides are dense bushes and trees. At the veranda's rail, peering out through a spyglass, stands a fleshy, chatty Englishman in his forties. Behind him, on a perch in her cage, is Almire's pet <coughs> minor bird. Father is coming, Eugenia. Father? 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 Yes, that's my dearest. Almire returns the spyglass to his eye, then quickly lets it fall. Setting it on the table, he approaches the birdcage, retrieves the bird, and begins gently stroking her feathers. We shall make you pretty for father, shan't we, dearest? Pretty? 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 <coughs> 
Yes, that's my pet. Placing the bird on his shoulder, Almayer steps down from the veranda in the direction of the courtyard. At the same time, the captain is leading Willems up the jetty. Now remember, the Raja is a friend of mine. My word is law here. My partner, Almayer, I think you know him, from Hudiks, yes? Well, he's the only other white man who knows the way here. Now you must keep mum about my entrance. You saw it wasn't easy. There's many here would give their eye teeth for knowledge of it. You'll help Almayer in his trading if you've the mind to. Just to kill time till I come back. Six weeks at most. Almire and the bird approach. <laughs> Don't you father me. I've told you. Yes. I think you two know each other. Yes, Almire. You see, Willems, I've brought prosperity to this place. Isn't that so, Almire? Well, yes, I... Of course it's so. And I mean to keep the Arabs out of it with their craftiness and their intrigues. And I shall keep them out if it costs me my fortune. Almayer's manservant, a native Malay man in his 40s, approaches with a tray of drinks. Greetings, Raja Laut. Raja Laut. The captain grabs a drink, which he drains in one gulp. <sighs> Means king of the sea. It's what they call me in these parts. All righty now. Must go, must go. Father, I mean, captain... I know. That Arab, Abdullah, will be waiting, and he'll be after me like a shot once I'm in his sights. But never you fear. Raja Laud and his trusty Flash will have the heels of anything that floats among these islands. Yes, but... Take good care of him, Almayer. Six weeks, no more. But I... Six weeks, but... Six weeks. The captain heads for the jetty and doesn't look back. Known him since he was a boy. Clever. He's a trader like us. Trader! Yes. Later, at dusk, in a wilder part of the island, a native camp can be seen. Three thatch huts ring a large fire pit. An obsequious Malay man in his fifties, with eye patch, beetle juice stained lips, and clothes of a pirate's age, tends a small fire. Nearby, an earthy Malay woman nearer sixty uses a large stick in a wooden pot to husk rice. It was written, I tell you, written on his forehead that he should end his life in darkness, like a man walking in a black night, eyes open yet seeing nothing. Ha! You don't believe, Babalachi? Believe? I tell you, Babalachi ah. was by his side when he had many slaves and many wives and much merchandise. Yes, boats for trading and boats for fighting. Ah. Oh, he was a great chief in those days, let me tell you. Before the breath of the merciful put out the light in his eyes, for years he led the men who drink blood on the sea. First in prayer and first in fight. Aye, those were the days. Oh, he was rich, my chief was. Rich and strong. <laughs> strong in those days. Those days? There were not so many fire ships with guns that shot death from afar. Not in those days. Uh, but now he eats from a beggar's bowl. Only a daughter for company. A sea dog with white teeth. Like a woman of the white man. Her mother was from the west, you know. From Baghdad. Only the eyes. The eyes. But she doesn't wear the veil because nobody comes near except to ask the blind one for a blessing. This talk is good once, twice, but when said too often becomes nah, foolish. Like the babbling of child. How many times have I predicted the cloudy sky and read the wind of the rainy seasons? You must be of season pass, for I cannot hear it in your I tell you, before Raja Laut, Raja Laut, the blind one, was the true king of the sea. After Raja Laut, only burning and the wailing of the woman and child, the ground slippery with blood, the mangroves full of men struck down before they could lay their eyes on the enemy. Our once swift boats wedged together in the narrow creek, but Burning, burning. Huh. He was half dead, you know, when Babalachi found him. And completely blind, both sons burned alive by fire from the ships of the white man. <sighs> But I, Babalachi... You, Babalachi... I, Babalachi... You saved the blind one, I know. And you crawled to our Raja and you begged. Huh? You are a beggar now too. Nah. Hey, I 
can still handle this stick, you know? Yeah, and where do you think that rice you're asking comes from, eh, beggar woman? It comes from the rice paddy, you disreputable old skimmer. Now, take that busy tongue eh? and that one good eye of yours Ugh. and get or you shan't enjoy your bowl of evening rice tonight. Or what comes after? <laughs> a day or two later, by the bank of an inlet under a giant tree, Willems disembarks from a small canoe to watch a raven-haired young native woman in her 20s fill bamboo water jugs from a nearby brook. When the jugs are nearly full, Willems quickly retreats and sits, his back turned on the grass. Emerging from behind the tree, the native woman is startled to see the back of this strange white man. Taking cover behind the tree trunk, she steals furtive glances at Willems. Finally, he turns. Who are you? Aisa pokes out her head from behind the tree. <laughs> That's it? She pokes her head out again. I don't bite. At least not at first. I'm Willems. I am the daughter of the blind one. The blind one? You mean blind Omar? Yeah. You are the son of the white trader. I am white. But I... You are a great man, yes? No, I, uh... I'm a, an outcast, actually. Outcast? Yes. But you... You are beautiful. <laughs> yes, very. <laughs> Willems goes to her and, gently taking one of her water jugs, gestures to a nearby pathway, down which the two stroll casually, in flirtatious conversation. Later, Babalachi and the old woman eat bowls of rice before the fire. Mm. Since Raja Laut left the strange white man here, the daughter of the blind one has spoken to other ears than mine. <coughs> Why would a white man listen to a beggar's daughter? <laughs> Babalachi has seen, has seen. What has Babalachi seen? Hmm? With his one eye? <laughs> Seen the strange white man walking on the narrow path before the sun could dry the drops of dew on the bushes. He's heard the whisper of the white man's voice as he spoke to that daughter with the big eyes and pale skin. Woman in body, but man in heart. <laughs> Babalachi knows the white man. In many lands has he seen them. Always slaves to their desires, always ready to yield their strength, their reason. <laughs> into the hands of some woman. Hmm. Let one white man destroy another. They are fools. They know how to keep faith with their enemies, but towards each other, they know only deception. Huh? Aye. Babalachi has seen, has seen. Seen what? Babalachi has seen plenty. No. What is needed, what is needed, old woman, is an alliance. Someone to set up against the white man. A rich trader. Someone who could help defeat Raja Laud. Raja Snaud? <coughs> ah? <laughs> Another white trader we would not be able to trust. The man we want should be rich and without scruples. He should have many followers. Be a well-known personality in the islands. Personality? Such a man might be found among the Arab traders. Arab scarab. He has kept every one of them out of the river. Most are afraid. Afraid to provoke the white man's anger. But all, I tell you, all do not know. They simply do not know how to get here. Only Raja Laud knows that. Or perhaps someone who has recently come here with Raja Laud. Eh? Hey? A white man betrays people. <laughs> the old woman rises and collects Babalachi's bowl. Babalachi stands, then moves behind the old woman and presses up against her. Anyway, Babalachi must be patient. Babalachi cups the old woman's breasts. It would not do to be seen to have a hand. In this. Your hands are in everything. Yes. But should my plan fail, the vengeance of Raja Laud would be mm, swift and mm, certain. <laughs> the old woman makes for a nearby hut, but sensing he hasn't stirred, she stops and turns. Well? No. Babalachi must wait. Must wait. I wouldn't wait too long. <laughs> she shoots him a come-hither smile, then vanishes into the hut. With an anticipatory grin, Babalachi follows. The next day, Willems lay sprawled out under the big tree, when Aisa, toting her water jugs, pokes her head from behind the trunk. Psst! 
You came. Aisa smiles back. After a pause, she comes closer. When he smiles, she moves closer still. Your... Aisa gestures to her arm. Arms? Yes, they're so... Big. Yeah, big. <laughs> and this? The hair on my arm. We do not have. Don't you? See? Huh. And your... Adam's apple? No, no, no. Your... Ooh. Oh, my voice. Yes, your voice. You like it? It's like the sound in a cave. You mean deep? Yeah, deep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are beautiful. <laughs> you are? Yes. Undoubtedly. Willem. Willems. Willems. <laughs> yes, like I said, an outcast. Not great? Once, perhaps again. Hmm. Father was once a great man, a great fighter. What is your word? Pirate. Huh, a pirate, eh? Yes, against the white man. I see. Yes, that occupation is no longer quite so lucrative. Lucrative? Uh, profitable. Hmm? Uh, no money in it. Ah, no money. And pirates all die, except father and Babalachi. The one-eyed fellow? One eye, yeah. Ah, I see. One eye and me, we save father. We steal canoe full of coconuts. Did you now? Take father to the village of our Raja. Raja give father rice. I cook rice for father. I cook rice for Willems too. <laughs> Will you now? Well, I don't know what to say. Except that I miss your smile already. And we haven't even yet parted. <laughs> Aisa quickly puts down her jugs and takes his hand in hers. He immediately pulls it back, as if from instinct. Staring at him intently, she begins to lightly caress the hair at his temple and the skin down his cheek. While he trembles, she springs up, grabs her jugs and dashes off. <laughs> he gets to his feet slowly, then walks deliberately over to the canoe, gets into it and takes up the paddle, stopping only to turn and stare at the spot she and he had occupied moments before. Later that evening, at the trading post, Almayer and Willem sit before a finished meal and half-empty bottle at the table. Lend me your gun tonight, Almayer. I have a mind to go look for a deer tonight when the moon's full. <laughs> you might say yes or no instead of making that unpleasant sound. If I believed one word of what you say, I would. As it is, what's the use? You know where the gun is. Take it or leave it. Almayer drains his drink and pours himself another. It's a gazelle you're after, my honoured guest. You'll be wanting gold anklets and silk sarongs for that game, mighty hunter. But you won't get those from me, I promise you. All day amongst the natives. A fine help to me you are. You shouldn't drink so much, Almea. You don't have the head for it. Never had, from what I remember. I drink my own, which is more than I can say about you. After looking at each other savagely, they both turn away and then stand. As the manservant loads a tray with dishes, Almeyer kicks off his slippers and scrambles into the hammock. Willems descends the steps and makes his way across the courtyard towards the jetty. Bring me another bottle and some fresh water for Eugenia. Yes, Mr. Alameyer. As the manservant exits and Willems continues down the jetty, Almeyer moves to the cage and takes out the bird. I thought the bad man would go, didn't I, dearest? <laughs> hey, don't you want the gun? That man's a pig, isn't he, Eugenia? Pig, pig, pig. Back at the camp, it's sunset, and one eye stands outside the middle hut. Chief, it is I, Babalachi. <sighs> Babalachi enters the hut and, after a few moments, emerges leading a blind, gaunt, head-shaven Malay man in his sixties, who he guides to a stump near the fire. Is the sun near its setting? Yes, Chief. Near, very near. Where, where am I? Why have I been taken from a place I knew where I could move without fear? I've not heard the sound of her footsteps since the morning. Twice, a strange hand has given me my food. She is near, oh brave one. And he, where is he? Not here, I hope. No, not here. Not here, eh? But he shall return soon, oh brave one. Return? Oh, crafty one. Oh, I have cursed him three times. He's cursed, no doubt. Yet he shall be here soon enough. You too are crafty and faithless. I have made you great. You are dirt under my feet. Less than dirt. I have fought at your side many times, oh brave one. Why did he come? To foul the air I breathe, to mock my fate, to poison her mind and still her body. 
Oh, she's grown hard of heart to me. She has. Hard and merciless and stealthy like rocks that tear out a ship's life under a smooth sea. She's forgotten me and my sons are dead. And that man, that man is an infidel and a dog. Why did he come? Did you show him the way? He found the way himself, oh brave one. But then Babalachi saw a way for the white man's destruction and our greatness. And if Babalachi saw correctly, there shall be peace and glory and riches, oh brave one. Riches. Do not let him back. He cannot escape his fate, O oh brave one. He shall come back, and the power of men we have always hated, you and I, shall crumble into dust in our hands. And you see all of this, while I, I see... Only darkness. <laughs> yes, O oh brave one. No, flame. The flame of that last day. I see it still. I hear it. The sound of the earth and the flame of the fire from the death ship took my sons. You are my chief and you are wise, O oh brave one. And in your wisdom, you shall speak to the Arab Abdullah when he comes. You shall speak to him as Baba Lachi has advised. Baba Lachi, your servant. The man who fought at your right hand for many, many moons. <sighs> I have heard by messenger that Abdullah is coming late tonight. For these things need to be done secretly, lest Raja Laut hear of them. Raja Laut. Abdullah will be here by daylight. Allah willing. So, I am to speak to the mighty Abdullah, your wisdom, which I do not understand. You must trust Babalachi, O oh brave one. How many white men are here, O oh crafty one? Two. Two white men to fight one another. Will they die? Tell me. Will they both die? They shall surely die. I can pass my hand over their faces when Allah has made them stiff. If such is their fate, Allah is great. Oh, I am alone. I am alone. Is anybody near me? Anybody? I am afraid of this strange place. I am by your side, oh brave one. As in the days we were both young. Was there such a time? I have forgotten. As the sun set, Babalachi. Lo, as the highest tree, O oh brave one. Then it's time for prayer. As Babalachi helps Omar stand, Aisa enters without a sound. Motioning for her to remain silent, Babalachi leads the old man back into the hut. Emerging a moment later, Babalachi approaches Aisa. It's the third sunset, the last, and he's not here. What have you done? Babalachi leads her out of earshot. I have kept my word, O oh daughter of the brave one. This morning, I sent a man in a canoe to look for him. Then, at the fifth hour, I sent another canoe with four men. The man you long for may come when he likes. But he's not here. I waited for him yesterday. Tomorrow, I shall go. Do you doubt your power, O oh daughter? You, who are more beautiful to him than a houri of the seventh heaven. Why, he is your slave. A slave does run away sometimes, and then the master must go and find him. Do you want to live and die like a beggar? I do not care. Do you think, girl, that he himself would agree to live like a beggar even with you? He's great. He despises all of you. All of you. He's a man. Remember, girl, to hold a man, you must be like the great sea to a thirsty traveler, a never-ceasing torment, and a madness, a madness. Hold him! Beat him down! Drag out his head! You can go to hell, you sons of dirty... Go to hell, I say! Oh, the fool! Babalachi has kept his promise. Remember, like the sea, to the thirsty. Go, go! As Aisa runs off in the direction of Willem's voice, Babalachi exits in the opposite direction. Let him be! Let him be! Omar crawls out of the hut on hands and knees. Daughter, are you there? Lifting his arms, Omar tries futilely to fill with them. Daughter. Are you there? Willems enters carrying Aisa, her body pressed to his, eyes closed, arms around his neck. Who's there? Who's there? Their faces illuminated by the fire, Willems stares hard at the blind and prostrate Omar. Is somebody there? Willems turns and vanishes with Aisa into a hut. Daughter, who's there? 
Who's, who's there? Who's there? Our tale continues five weeks later at Almire's trading post. <coughs> Suddenly, the figure of Willems can be seen moving stealthily across the courtyard to a spot below the veranda where he hides. Psst, Almire. Psst, Almire. What? What's that? Here, down here. Almire. Good heavens, I thought you were a ghost. May I come up? Don't you dare. Don't you dare! I don't want to hear you or speak to you either. Listen to me. It's something important. Not to me, surely. Yes, to you. Very important. You are always a humbug. Always. There was no one like you for cleverness, fellows used to say. But you never took me in. I never believed in you, Willems. I admit your superior intelligence. Listening to me would be further proof of it. You'll be sorry if you don't. Oh, come up, come up. You'll catch sunstroke and die on my doorstep. Almire retrieves the bird from her cage and places her on his shoulder. Willems, who has climbed the veranda stairs, steps into the light. His beard's unkempt, his jacket's torn. Below the waist, over bare feet, he wears a faded sarong. Well, I am here. So I see. You might have spared me this treat. You've been gone five weeks, if I'm not mistaken. I got on very well without you, thank you. And now that you are here, you are not very pretty to look at. Let me speak, will you? You, you think you're in the forest with your, your friends? This is a civilised man's house, a white man's house. Understand? I've come here for your good. And mine. You look as though you'd come for a good meal. Don't they give you enough to eat, these new relations of yours? Why, that old blind cutthroat must be delighted by your company. You realise he was the greatest thief and murderer of these seas. Say, do you exchange confidences? Tell me, Williams, did you kill someone in Macassar, or did you only steal something? I didn't steal. I borrowed. They lied. I... So you did steal. I thought it was something of that kind. And now you steal again? I don't mean from me, but that girl, eh? The daughter. You stole her. You didn't pay the old fellow. Stop it. She's no good to him now, is she? Oh, mate, listen to me. If you're a human being, listen. I suffer terribly. And for your sake. For my sake? Now you're raving. You don't know. She's gone. Gone. Two days. Had enough of you already, eh? It's not flattering for you, my superior countryman. At first it was like a, a vision of heaven, she and I. Pure, unblemished heaven. But since she left, I now know what hell means, what darkness is. I know what it's like to be torn to pieces. You may, of course, come and live here with me again. After all, father did leave you in my care. You satisfied yourself by going away, very good. Now you want to come back, so be it. But, mind you, I am no friend of yours. I act strictly for the captain. Come back to you and abandon her. You think I'm mad? To think she moves, lives, breathes out of my sight. I'm jealous of the wind that fans her, of the very air she breathes. I haven't seen her for two days. Two days! Oh, you bore me, Willems. Why don't you go after her instead of coming here? <laughs> Don't you know where she is? She can't be very far. No native craft has left this river for the last fortnight. She's in Babalachi's camp. Is that right? With that old pirate, eh? Afraid of old one-eye, are you? Or is it your dignity that prevents you from following her there, my high-minded friend? You're a fool. I should like to kick you. No, you're too weak for that. You look starved. I don't think I've eaten anything the last two days. Perhaps more. I, I can't remember. Look, I've been biting myself to block out the other. Torment. Willems collapses into a nearby chair and closes his eyes. What a revolting exhibition. I can have Eugenia here give you a real bite if that's what you're after. Honestly, what could father see in you? That from you, who sold your soul for a few guilders. Whatever I've sold, and at what price. I never meant you of all people to spoil my bargain. Why, even father wouldn't touch you now, not with a ten-foot pole. Father. Yes, father. I want to become a trader in this place, Almeyer. You do, do you? I want a house and trade goods, perhaps a little money. Anything else you want? My coat, perhaps? 
or my boots. It's only natural she should expect the advantages which... And then I could shut up that wretched father of hers. I'd have her all to myself, away from her people, all mine, to mould, to adore, to soften, to... Then go away to some distant place where, far away from all she knew, I would be the world to her. I would repay every cent, of course, every cent. It needn't interfere with your business. It would cut out the small native traders is all. The captain would approve. It would be a loan, after all, and I'd be safe at hand. The captain would approve. The captain would approve, would he? I have good grounds for my demand. Curse your demand. Your position here is not as safe as you think. An unscrupulous rival could destroy your trade in a year. The captain's absence gives courage to certain individuals. Proposals have been made. You are very much alone here. Even the Raja has abandoned you. Damn the Raja! I am master here! Don't you see? <laughs> Don't you see? I see a mysterious ass. What are the meaning of these veiled threats? The Arabs have been hanging around outside this river for years, and still I am the only trader here. Do you bring me a declaration of war? Then it's from yourself only. I know all my other enemies. I ought to shoot you, but you're not worth the powder and the shot. You ought to be destroyed with a stick like a snake. Snake! Clear out. Clear out, I said. Don't you see how you frighten the bird? As Willems descends the steps, Almaya takes the bird on his finger and strokes her. Look how he runs away, Eugenia. Isn't that funny? Call Pig after him, dearest. Pig. Pig. <coughs> That's my pet. As Almaya strokes the bird's feathers, he continues to track and gloat over the retreating Willems. Yes. Yes. At dusk in the gated courtyard before his house, Babalachi walks with Abdullah, a handsome, prosperous-looking Arab in his 40s. Dressed in a flowing white gown, Abdullah has a close beard, trimmed to a rounded point, a regal bearing, and prayer beads in his hands. With all reverence, oh, excellent one, who is this white captain to keep all the world away but for him? True. Very true. He took hold of our Raja's mind and hardened his heart. He put words into his mouth and caused his hand to strike left and right. We had to trade with him, accept such goods as he would give, and he exacted payment every year. Every year. Yes, also true. What could we do? A man must trade. There was nobody else. Of course. We are tired of paying debts to that fat white man. The son of the captain he is not content to hold us in the palm of his hand. He seeks to cause our very death. He trades with the forest people who are no better than monkeys. Buys from them rubber and rattans while we starve. Why, only two days ago, I went to him and said, Tohan al Mayar, I have such and such goods to sell. Will you buy? He spoke to me as if I was a slave. One eye, you are lucky to get anything in these hard times. Bring your goods quickly and I shall receive them in payment of what you owe me from last year. Then he laughed and he struck me on the shoulder with his open hand, his open hand, oh excellent one. If my ship can enter this river, I shall come. It can't, one. It can. There is a white man here. I want to see the blind one and this white man you wrote about. You shall see them both, oh excellent one. When I saw the second son of the white man enslaved by the daughter of the blind one, I knew he would be soft in my hand, like the mud of the river. <laughs> At first, he answered my talk with bad words, in the manner of the white man. Afterwards, when listening to the voice he loved. He hesitated. He hesitated for many days, oh excellent one. Too many. Knowing him well, I brought the blind one and his daughter here. Then the white man raged for three days like a hungry panther. This evening he came. He is in the grasp of one with a merciless heart. I have him. That is good. And he shall guide your ship and lead in the fight, if fight there be. By Allah. And you will have to open your hand, O oh, beneficent one. You will have to satisfy the greed of a man who is not a man, and so is greedy of ornaments. They shall be satisfied, but... What is it, O oh, excellent one? The man is an unbeliever. He cannot live under my shadow. No, O oh, pious one. When this man has done all we want, 
What is to be done with him? He can be made useful in other ways. Must I feed this infidel forever and ever? Not forever, no. Only while it serves your designs, oh generous one. When the time comes and you give the order, a little poison may be found. Yes. I am your slave and your offering, if you will allow me. Proceed. The Honorable Omar, oh excellent one. Once Abdullah has disappeared inside, Babalachi closes the door and makes his way back through the gate to the fire pit. There, he squats and, grabbing some kindling, feeds it to the flames. When Willems emerges silently from his hut, Babalachi takes no notice. Where's Abdullah? Oh. I said, where's Abdullah? In my house, with the blind one. Add more wood to the fire. I want to see your face. As Babalachi adds more wood, Willems looks at him hard. You are in good health, please God? Yes. You? Willems grabs Babalachi by the shoulders, and Babalachi sways. With a jerk, Willems lets him go. Stumbling backwards, Babalachi wriggles his shoulders as Willems turns on his heel, then warms his hands at the fire. Mm. What a man! What a strong man! A man like that could upset mountains! But why be angry with Babalachi, who only thinks of your good? Did Babalachi not give her refuge in his camp? Yes, it is Babalachi's camp, but he will let you have it for free, because a woman to one, a woman must have a home. <laughs> but who can know a woman's mind, eh? And such a woman, if she wanted to go away from that other place, who is Babalachi to say no? After all, Babalachi is her father's servant. I said gladden Babalachi's heart by taking his house. Did I not do right? If she takes a fancy to go away from this place, it is you who shall suffer. I shall wring your neck. Why say, Babalachi, hey, Tuan, you know what she wants. A splendid destiny, like all women. You have been wronged and cast out by your people. She knows that. But you are strong. You are a man. And to on, Babalachi is older than you. You are in her hand. Mm. Such is the fate of strong men. She is of noble birth and cannot live like a slave. A slave? You know her. You are in her hand. Remember, Babalachi has seen much. Submit to one. Submit. <gasps> or else what? She may go away again. Who knows? Willem spins around sharply and Babalachi jumps back. If she goes, it will be bad for you. You hear me? Yes, I have heard it before. If she goes, Babalachi. <sniffs> but will that bring her back to one? If it is Babalachi's doing, it is Babalachi's doing. Yet who knows? You may have to live without her. <laughs> you threaten me, do you? Babalachi threaten? He who speaks only of life, when Duan speaks only of death. Aisa emerges from a hut, with her body wrapped and wearing a veil. Only her eyes are visible. Take it off. You think that man's eyes can see you through the walls of that house? I said, take it off. Aisa doesn't move. In the distance, Abdullah can be seen emerging from the house. There is Tuan Abdullah. As Babalachi sets off to fetch Abdullah, Willems and Aisa don't move. Their eyes remain fixed on the man in the white gown. Babalachi opens the gate and bows to Abdullah. I shall now take you to the white man, oh excellent one. As Babalachi shepherds Abdullah to the fire pit, Abdullah's eyes remain fixed on Willems. Within two paces of him, Abdullah stops and lifts his right hand in greeting. Willems nods. We know each other. Twan Abdullah. We have traded together, but it was far from here. But I think we may trade here also. The place does not matter. It is the open mind and the true heart that are required for business. True, true. Both of us are travelers. In leaving home, one learns life. One returns with much wisdom. <laughs> I shall never return. I'm done with my people. Abdullah lifts his eyebrows. As you wish. Greetings, O oh excellent one. I am daughter to the blind one. We welcome you as a member of our family. Abdullah glances at her swiftly, then fixes his eyes on the ground. Aisa puts out her hand, covered with a corner of her veil, and Abdullah takes it, presses it, drops it, and turns towards Willems. Aisa backs away, then vanishes into a hut. I know what you came for, Twan Abdullah. I've been told by that man there. It won't be easy. Allah makes even the difficult easy. As Willems moves away from the fire and from Babalachi, Abdullah follows. I was at sea with him for many years. 
and I watched carefully when he piloted into the river. In knowledge, there is safety. Of that, you can be sure. Allah willing. You shall pay me the money as soon as I step on board. The boat that brings me shall then take the money to the blind one. Of course. Then I shall pilot you into the river. Agreed. My life is in your hand. Willems grabs Abdullah's passive palm and shakes it. Yes. I shall go now and wait for you outside the river. Until the second sunset. Taking several strides away, Abdullah suddenly turns back. You have only one word, Tuan. Yes, only one. Abdullah nods, taking his leave. As Willems watches Babalachi shepherd Abdullah to the gate, Aisa emerges and gently touches Willems on the back. He spins, violently tears off her veil, stamps on it, and then retreats to the fire. Aisa doesn't flinch, and after a long pause, she exits swiftly into the hut. Babalachi and Abdullah, meanwhile, stroll in the courtyard. I trust you will not forget the humble servant who has brought you here, O oh generous one. Yes. Have I not spoken the truth? She has made roast meat of his heart. He must be perfectly safe. Do you understand? As if he was among his own people. Until... Until when, O oh excellent one? Until I say. Remember. The white man must be safe. Abdullah turns and exits down a bushy pathway. Babalachi then retreats through the gate towards the fire pit. Seeing Aisa emerge from the hut, Babalachi takes cover and watches. Aisa silently approaches Willems, who adds wood to the fire. Reaching out with her fingers, Aisa strokes Willems gently at the nape of his neck, which immediately softens him. What should I say to a man who has been away from me for three days? Three. Willem snatches at the fingers she's held up, but she whisks them behind her. No, I cannot be caught. But try. <laughs> try and catch me with your mighty hands. <laughs> After a brief dance, he catches her and embraces her passionately. Closer. Closer. Slowly raising her arms, she puts them over his shoulders and clasping her hands behind his neck, swings off the full length of her arms. Her head falls back and her thick luscious hair hangs down. His expression is that of a starving man looking at food. She draws herself to him and rubs her head gently against the skin of his cheek. I wish I could die like this, right now. Taking his hand, Aisa leads Willems into the hut. Once they're inside, Babalachi stands and, approaching the pit, begins adding wood to the fire. <clears throat> I am chief of Java. I've no match at sea. I'm home from this street. My boat is running free. My hills rich with silver, the runs red like wine. My men smiling faces mean plunder so fine. My men smiling faces mean plunder so fine. Feeding a fire Final branch to the fire, Babalachi stands, then sets off contentedly in the direction of his house. Willems emerges from a hut, pulling on his shirt. Aisa follows behind. Tell me all the words spoken between you and Tuan Abdullah. Leave it. Now, now. Wait. What? Who was that? Could be Babalachi. Huh. Now promise me, promise me. You will not return to your people without me. Do you promise? But I told you that you're everything to me. Yes, but I like to hear you say it. Hmm. White women, are they very beautiful? They must be. I, I don't know. And if I did, looking at you, I've forgotten. Three days and two nights, you have forgotten me also. Why? Why were you angry when I first spoke of Tuan Abdullah? You were remembering somebody then, one of your people. Mm. Yet, I believe you when you talk of your love for me. But I'm afraid. I'm with you now. It was you who went away. When you have helped Abdullah against Raja Laut, I shall not be afraid any longer. What is that land beyond the great sea from which you come? You asked me to go there with you. That is why I went away. I'll never ask you again. There is no woman there? Waiting for you? No. You taught me the love of your people. Like this. Yeah, like this. Yes. I love you, my sweet, my beautiful girl. Yes. Her lips hover above his face and her long hair brushes against his cheeks. As she kisses him, he closes his eyes and trembles. Slowly, the door of a nearby hut opens and, out of the corner of his eye, Willems notices the head of Omar, knife between his teeth, inching towards him. Willems is spellbound as the outlines of a body crawling on all fours emerges, creeping towards him inch by inch. Willems turns back to an oblivious Aisa and drowns himself in a deep kiss. Again, he kisses her, but only after moving his head so he can see the blind man moving closer. The emaciated face, the hollow temples, the sunken cheeks, the dark sockets, the dead eyes. Omar raises himself to his knees and the blade between his lips catches a gleam from the fire. 
Omar's hand reaches out and touches Willem's on his side. Taking the knife in his other hand, Omar raises it high above his head. With an intense effort, Willem's tears his eyes off Omar and onto Aisa, who, sensing danger, turns, grabs her father's hand, brings him to the ground, and struggles with him for the knife. Son of the devil. The old woman emerges as Omar attempts to plunge the knife into Aisa's breast. But Aisa resists, and the blade plunges instead into Omar's breast. Omar responds by trying to fight back, but Aisa holds him down. As Aisa continues to hold her father down, Willem stands and steps forward, but Aisa turns a wild face to Willem's. The last of Omar's struggle is ferocious. Tears stream down Aisa's face as she holds him down. Finally, he gives up. With tremendous effort, Aisa begins dragging her father into a nearby hut. You are cursed, daughter! Cursed! Ignoring her, Aisa keeps dragging her father towards the hut. Oh, you killed him! Never! You killed him with his own blade! I'd sooner strike it into my own heart! Aisa finishes dragging her father into the hut. Eh, hey, you there! You are the devil's son! Get you back to hell! Ah, get! Willems avoids her but doesn't leave. The old woman then retreats backwards, eyes on Willems, through the gate and into Babalachi's house. After a moment, Aisa emerges from the hut, in her hands the bloody knife. Only misfortune for those who are not white. How can I live here? Let's go away, far away, just you and I. Tomorrow we'll be outside, on board Abdullah's ship. If the ship were to go ashore by some chance, we could steal a canoe and escape. You're not afraid of the sea? Freedom, Aisa. Freedom. Have you not heard the old woman? She's cursed me because I love you. You brought me sorrow and trouble. And now you want to take me far away where I would lose you, lose my life, because your life is my life now. What else is there? Flinging the blade at his feet, Aisa bolts for the gate. Without thinking, Willem stoops to retrieve the weapon. Aisa, come back. Come back! Opening then closing the gate behind her, Aisa disappears into the bush. Willems runs to the gate and leans on it, but does not pass through. I I'll do what you want, if I have to set all of Sambear on fire and put that fire out with my blood. Only come back, do you hear me, Aisa? You sleep. I am afraid of you. When you return with Tuan Abdullah, you shall be great, and you will find me here. There will be nothing but love. Nothing but love. Aisa! Aisa! Back at Elmire's, Elmire and the captain stand in mid-conversation on the veranda. Cat, dog, anything that can scratch or bite, as long as it is harmful enough and mangy enough. A sick tiger would make you happy. A half-dead tiger you could weep over and then palm off on some poor devil on your crew. Never mind when the poor devil is mangled or eaten up. No, your heart bleeds only for what is poisonous and deadly. I curse the day you set eyes on him. I curse it. Now then, my boy, now then. Remember that half-starved dog you brought on board in Bangkok? It went mad the next day and bit the headman, the best headman you ever had. The man foamed at the mouth and left two wives and however many children. How about those damned Chinamen you rescued from that waterlogged junk in the Formosa Straits? They rose on you within 48 hours. They were cutthroats and you knew they were cutthroats, but you had made up your mind to put down on a lee shore in a gale to save them. I might have been ruined for the sake of those murderous scoundrels who had to be driven overboard after killing how many of your beloved crew? You call these the actions of a devoted partner? Huh? And all on account of your absurd disregard for your safety. Yet I bore you no grudge. I knew your weaknesses, but now, now we're ruined. Ruined! If you'd been in trouble as often as I have, my boy, you wouldn't carry on so. I've been ruined more than once, and, well, here I am. Had you been here a month ago, you would have been of some use. But now, you might as well be in the Formosa Straits. You scold like a drunken fishwife. Moving to the rail, the captain looks out on the river. It's very lonely here this morning, eh? Oh, you notice it. Only a month ago, this veranda would have been full of people, grinning and salaaming. But that day is over. It's the doing of that pet rascal of yours. Oh, he's a beauty. You should have seen him leading that hellish crowd. You would have been proud of your old favourite. Clever fellow, you must admit. Is that all you have to say? Oh, Lord. Oh, don't make a show of yourself, Almeyer. Sit down. Let's talk quietly. So he led, did he? He piloted in Abdullah's ship. When did this happen? On the 16th, I heard rumours of Abdullah's ship being on the river. I refused to believe it at first, but the next day there was a great council held openly at Babalachi's camp. Almost everybody in Sambir attended. It was then I knew. Within two days, Abdullah's ship was anchored in full view of this house. Let's see now. 
six weeks to the day. And you never heard anything? No warning? Never had an idea that something was up or come? I used to hear something every day. Lies, mostly, as you well know. You're hardly a green hand on his first voyage, Almayer. That scoundrel did come here one day. He'd been away from the house for a couple of months, living with that woman. I only heard about them now and then from the Rajas people when they came over. Well, one day, Psst. around noon, Almayer. he appeared in this courtyard, as if he'd been jerked up from hell, where he belongs, by the way. Go on. I must say, he looked awful. Bad bout of malaria, probably. That part of the island's very unhealthy. Go on. He came to see you? Well, whatever it was, it wasn't enough to finish him. And he turned up here with his usual arrogance. He threatened me, wanted to scare me, blackmail me, and said you would approve. Can you believe that? Mm. I couldn't make out what the fellow was driving at. How could I know he knew enough to pilot a ship through? Anybody here I could deal with but Abdullah. He carries a dozen brass six-pounders and thirty men, desperate beggars from Delhi and Akeen. Fight all day and ask for more in the evening, that kind. I know, I know. Willems brought her up himself. I could see him from here. That woman was there too, close to him. Hmm. There have been rumours, of course. That blind rascal died under mysterious circumstances and that Abdullah is tired of Willems. At any rate, your pet still has to take the ship out. The headman's not equal to it yet. So he came to you first, did he? Said he needed to be set up as a trader, the swine. How could I know he would do harm in that way? A local uprising I could put down easy with my own men, and with Raja's help. Of course. Come to think of it, not a quarter of an hour after I kicked Willems out, Babalachi himself shows up, casually like, standing where you are now. They said the blind pirate and him were quite bothered by Willems, who was hanging about that woman, the pirate's daughter. He asked my advice, very deferential and proper. I told him Willems was not my friend, and that they'd better kick him out. Whereupon they went away, salaming and attesting to his friendship and the pirate's goodwill. Of course, I know he came to spy and talk over some of my men. And right away, wouldn't you know it? Eight, go missing. Eight. I immediately sent a message to the Raja that we ought to talk, that there was disquiet in the settlement. You know what answer I got? The Raja sends a friend's greeting, but doesn't understand the message. That was all. Cheerful, isn't it? Like cold water down the back. Well, after my manservant disappeared, I stood by this very table, listening to all the shouting and drumming. It was a terrible racket, enough for twenty weddings. I took the bird and brought her into my hammock. If it hadn't been for her, I surely would have gone mad. Remember, I hadn't heard from you for four months. Didn't know if you were alive or dead. The Roger would have nothing to do with me. My own men were deserting me like rats on a sinking ship. Things were so rowdy, I feared they would burn the house down over my head. So I got my revolver and laid it, loaded, on the table. Luckily, Eugenia kept quiet all through it, and seeing her so pretty and peaceful steadied me somehow. You have to understand, there was nothing to restrain those fellows. Why, only three months before, I distributed a goodly amount of rice on credit. There wasn't a thing to eat in this infernal place. They all came begging, on their knees. There isn't a man in Sambia who's not in debt to Lingard and company. You always said that was the right policy for us. Well, I carried it out. But a policy like that, a policy like that, father, should be backed by loaded rifles. You had them? Yes, I had. Twenty. And not a finger to pull a trigger. The captain drops into a chair and, without warning... You don't know your own strength. Look, the table's ruined. I'll have to eat squatting on the floor like a native. <laughs> well then, don't nag me like a woman at a drunken husband. That hadn't been for the loss of the flash, yes? She's gone, my boy. I would have been here months ago and all would have been well. But no use crying over that. We will have everything shipshape here in no time. No time at all. I am sorry about the flash, father. But you don't mean to expel Abdullah from here with a canoe, do you? No, that's over. All over. Great pity, too. They'll suffer for it. He'll squeeze them. If I had the flash here, I... <sighs> but she's gone and that's the end of it. Poor old hooker. You made a voyage or two on her. Wasn't she a sweet craft? Could make her do anything but talk. Why, she was better than a wife to me. And to think I should leave her poor old bones sticking on a reef as though I was the kind of skipper who must have a mile of water under his keel just to feel safe. It's only those who do nothing that make no mistakes, my boy. Upon my word, you are heartless. Perfectly heartless. Does it not strike you in all that, that in losing your ship, through recklessness, no doubt, you ruin me, ruin us? Come, come. You brought me here, made me your partner. And now, when everything's gone to the devil, you talk about your ship. Your ship! You can get another. But the trade, it's gone. Thanks to Willems, your dear Willems. Never mind about Willems. I shall look after him. As to the trade, why, I shall make your fortune yet, my boy. Never you fear. 
Have you any cargo for the schooner that brought me here? The sheds are full of rattans, and I have about 80 tons of rubber in the well. No doubt the last lot I shall ever see. So there was no robbery after all. We've lost nothing. Well then... No robbery? That's... that's an outrage. Almire falls back in his chair and begins having an epileptic fit. His face contorts, his eyes roll back in his head, and saliva drips down his chin. Grabbing a nearby water pitcher, the captain hastily pours out a glass and tips it into Almaya's mouth. Immediately, the convulsions subside. After a moment or two, Almaya comes to. You had a fit, my boy. Did you ever give me a fright so sudden? Yes, I lose all control. Well, take it easy. You mustn't exert yourself. You, you can tell me what happened, but don't exert yourself. I told you. He anchored the ship in view of the house. Through my glass, I could see faces on deck. Abdullah, Willems, old One-Eye, everybody. There was much discussion. Finally, a boat was lowered. One of Abdullah's men got into her, and the boat goes to the Rada's landing. Then, almost directly, the boat comes back. Willems and Abdullah go forward, very busy about something. That woman was with them. That... <coughs> All of a sudden, they fire a shot into the Rada's gate. Then another, and the gate bursts open. Whereupon, a feast breaks out on board ship. Abdullah sitting like an idol, cross-legged, hands in his lap, and Willems dodging about forward, aloof and looking at my house through the ship's glass. I couldn't resist. I shook my fist at him. You can't fight a man. The best thing is to exasperate him. Almaya shoots the captain an unkind look, but doesn't respond. Anyway, he saw me, and with his eye still on the glass, he lifts his arm, as if answering a hail. I figured, after the Raja, it was now my turn. So I ran the Union Jack up the flagpole. I had no other protection. Quite right. Quite right. I figured if anybody tried to land, I'd shoot. Then I kept quiet. After the feast, most of Abdullah's men went home. Only the great man himself and Willems stayed back. About five, I saw Willems join Abdullah at the wheel. Willems jabbered on, swung his arms about, then pointed at my house, then down the river. Finally, just before sunset, they took the ship down half a mile to the junction in the river, where she is now. I see. Willems did make one move, which I must say surprised me not a little. He raised a Dutch flag on the ship. Dutch? But hang it all, Abdullah is British. Abdullah wasn't there, somewhere on the shore. Anyway, upon the raising of the flag, that woman leapt at Willems, apparently, ah! like a wild beast. Ah! She had to carry her off and fling her into a canoe. Ah, and what else? The hardest thing. The hardest thing I've yet to tell. Well, go on now. I can't imagine it's worse than what you've already told me. Well, when my manservant came back, I felt a little easier in my mind. And then some of my men turned up. I didn't ask any questions, just set them to work as if nothing had happened. Towards the evening, I was on the jetty with Eugenia when I heard shouts at the far end of the settlement. At first, I didn't take much notice, but then my manservant runs up. Master, give me the bird. There is much trouble. So I gave her to him, went inside, grabbed my revolver, and came out into the courtyard. I heard a big crowd howling near the property line. I couldn't see them on account of the bushes, but I knew they were angry and after somebody. After somebody? That's right. And as I stood there wondering, you know that Chinaman who settled here a couple of years ago? He was my passenger. I brought him here. Well, he burst through the bush and fell right into my arms. Says they're after him because he won't take off his hat to the Dutch flag. The crowd quieted a little and I thought I could shelter him without much risk. And all of a sudden I hear Willem's voice. Let my men enter to get the Chinaman. I say nothing and tell the Chinaman to keep quiet. Don't resist, Almaya. I'm advising you as a friend. I am keeping this crowd back. You're a liar, I said. And then the Chinaman snatches my revolver and lets it fly them through the bush. He must have hit somebody because before you could wink they were through the bush and on top of us and I was on my back with a couple of fellows on top of me. I could hear the Chinaman trying to shout but they'd throttle him and he'd whimper. I could hardly breathe myself with two heavy fellows sitting on my chest. Anyway, Willems came up, running. Take him to the veranda. There, Willems cut down my hammock and threw it to them. Yanking open a drawer, he found some needle and twine. Lay him out on the floor. There, they wrapped me in my hammock and he began to stitch me in as if I was a, a corpse. I called him all the names I could think of. He ignored me and continued sewing. Sewed me up to my throat. <laughs> That'll do. But that woman, she was standing by. They all stared at me while I lay on the floor. Oh, there was a grin on every face, and the veranda was full of them, like a bale of goods I was. I wished I were dead. I do now when I think of it. That's terrible, my boy, terrible. Finally, they flung me into the big rocking chair. I was sewed in so tight, I was stiff like a piece of wood. Let's go. That woman, she danced and made faces. She was perfectly fiendish. I'm like white woman. Leave it. 
When are we going to kill him? I told you, leave it. I must have had a fit, because when I came to, he was sitting close and she was gone. Not a hair on your head shall be touched. Tell the captain that the flag you have hoisted has been respected, even though you fired first. You are a liar. A shot's been fired out of your compound and a man's been hit. Still, you shall be respected on account of the Union Jack and the captain. That's what he said. And as for you, Halmeyer, you will not forget this day. Not if you live to be a hundred. He said that, did he? And by the way, we found your manservant with your bird hiding in the bushes up the river. The bird recognized me and cried pig, as naturally as you would. But don't worry, I'm not angry. You look so ridiculous in this chair that I can't be angry. <laughs> I then made a frantic effort to free myself and get at that beggar's throat, but I only upset the chair over myself. I'm leaving you half your revolver cartridges and taking half myself. We are both white men and should back each other up. You're a thief, I shouted, but he never looked back. His arm was around the waist of that woman. Well, well. The captain moves to the rail and stares out at the river. I am done up, my boy. Perfectly done up. All night on deck getting that schooner up the river than this here with you. Feels like I could go to sleep on a clothesline. I suppose I should eat something, though. Of course. Roger Laut. Roger Laut. Yes, old girl. At least I have one native still with me. Now, we must try to keep some little trade together. It'll be all right. Now, the great thing, the great thing, will be the gold hunt up the river. I shall devote myself to it. I've been in the interior before. There's gold there, I'm sure of it. And I know what I'm talking about. Was in California in 49, you know. Dangerous, of course, but what a reward. We'd have to keep things on the sly at first. Then, after a little time has passed, we'll form a company. That's right, in London. Splendid, eh? There is something to live for yet, eh, my boy? But what about Willems? Damn Willems, damn him! Oh, my boy, my boy. The old captain is tired, dog tired. Have your manservant make up a little tray for me in my room. Of course, father. Father! As Almire exits into the house, the captain stares out at the river into the darkness. Father! The next day, the captain paces about the courtyard, in one hand a torn-out notebook page, in the other a fancy piece of parchment. Reading the notebook page, he frowns. Reading the parchment page, he frowns too. Almire approaches from the veranda with the bird on his shoulder. Look, Eugenia, it's father. Father! Yes, yes. Look, I've gotten two letters, Almire. This one's from Willems. Come and see me. I am not afraid. Are you? W. Dropping the piece of parchment, the captain snatches back the notebook page and rips it up. Almire retrieves the fallen parchment and reads it silently. That's a decent enough letter. Abdullah gives him up to you. I told you they were getting sick of him. What are you going to do? <clears throat> I'll be hanged if I know. Not yet. I wish you would do something. Soon. What's the hurry, eh? He won't go away. As it stands, he's at my mercy as far as I can see. Very little mercy he deserves, too. Abdullah's meaning, as far as I can make it out, is get rid of that white man for me and we shall live in peace and share the trade. You believe that? No doubt he will share for a time until he can grab the lot. Exactly. Well? <coughs> Are you unwell, father? <coughs> no, no, no. But I am bothered by all this, I can tell you. You will see Abdullah, won't you? I don't know. Not yet. There's plenty of time. You might want to consider me a little. I haven't robbed anybody or sold out a friend, but still. Have a little patience, my boy. A day or two more. Abdullah is clear. If you agree to pilot his ship out and instruct the headman, he'll drop Willems like a hot potato and be your friend ever after. As to Willems, I believe him completely. As to being your friend, it's a lie, of course, but we needn't bother about that just yet. Just say yes to Abdullah, and then whatever happens to Willems will be... Nobody's business. A fellow isn't worth the powder. That's what you think. You haven't been sewn up in your hammock in front of a bunch of savages. I daren't look anybody in the face while that scoundrel is alive. I'll settle him. I don't think you will. You think I'm afraid of him? No, I don't doubt your courage. It's your head, my boy, your head. Why don't you just call me a fool? Because I don't want to. If I wanted to call you a fool, I would. I wouldn't ask your permission. Why, I've done man's work before you could toddle. There's no talking to you when you're like this. Almire turns to go, but then hesitates. You'll do what you like, of course. You never take advice. But it wouldn't be wise to let that fellow get away from here. If you do nothing, you will leave in Abdullah's ship, for sure. And Abdullah will make use of him to hurt us. Now I must begin loading the schooner. Fire two shots if you need me. I hope you'll dine with me tonight. A tray in your room cannot be good for your digestion. <laughs> Look here, I shall want a good canoe and your manservant. Right now? No, no, the sun's too much for me. Send the canoe and your man and a canvas chair for me to sit in around sunset. Sunset? Yes. I shall pay our clever fellow a visit. At dusk at Babalachi's, all that remains of the hut where Aisa dragged her father is a small pile of ashes. 
Babalachi emerges from the hut of the old woman and makes his way slowly to the riverbank, where he leans heavily on a wood post. The old woman, who has followed him, comes up stealthily behind him and places her hand gently on his back. The night is black. Pitch black. I thought you might fall in, you old fool. Mm. Huh? I might. He fought his last fight, my chief. And he lost to his own daughter. That she-devil and that son of the white devil. They're cursed, I tell you. Mm, cursed. Mm, that may be so. It is so. Well, that may be. But Babalachi has plans. And these curses of yours, they are not very helpful. Not at the moment. Not until after Abdullah has... When there's a rustling in the bushes, the old couple turns to listen. You think this is the place? I see nothing. It must be near to one. Shall we try the bank? This cannot be it. Let her drift. Let her drift. Go inside, woman. I must speak to the Raja Laut alone. Raja Laut? Raja Snaut. I know. <laughs> now get. As the old woman retreats to her hut, Babalachi enters an adjacent hut, where, a moment or two later, he emerges carrying an old rifle, which he leans, just so, against the hut's exterior. Not satisfied with how the rifle appears, Babalachi places it again. Meanwhile, the captain and the manservant can be seen in a small canoe, the manservant paddling, and the captain in back on a canvas chair. I see a light! I see it! Call out! Somebody may come with a torch. I can't see a thing. Babalachi takes cover in the bush so as not to be seen. Oh, who speaks on the river? Is there not one torch in this camp to light a guest on his landing? There are no torches and no men. I am alone here. Alone? Who are you? Only your servant, Babalachi. Babalachi, you say? Land, Tuan, and see my face. Here is my hand. The captain reluctantly takes Babalachi's hand and steps out of the canoe. Now you are safe. As he takes a few cautious steps towards the courtyard, the manservant secures, then stands watch over the boat. You'd think the world had been painted black. What did you say, Duan? Nothing. I only expected to find here, but where are they all? As I said, I am alone. Tomorrow, I go to... I came to see a white man. Is he here? A man whose hand is strong, but whose heart is weak. White, yes, but still a man. Is he there, in the hut? No, not there, Duan. Yet not very far, either. Will you not sit and warm yourself, woman? The head of the old woman pops out of her hut. Bring rice and fish for our guest. No, I'm not hungry. <laughs> the head of the old woman pops back inside. The night is long. Very long. Raja Laut. Take me to the white man who expects me. I have no time to waste. Aye. I have seen your face and felt your hand before many moons ago. You do not remember, but I have not forgotten. You know me? There are many like me. There is only one, Raja Laut. Uh-huh. Wandering over to the hut where is leaned the rifle, the captain picks it up and examines it. I got it when I was young, from a trader with a big stomach and a loud voice. Brave, very brave. A martyr. Old, too. A good gun carries far and true. You should not let it get rusty like this. Better than yours there. With his fingertips, Babalachi gently touches the revolver, picking out from the captain's jacket pocket. Take your hand off that. Of course, Tuan. Now, about that white man. You are a man of the sea, like us. You know I am. Why ask? A true Raja Laut. Look, I didn't come here to chat. I came to see the white man. Show me where he lives. Why hurry, Tuan? The night is long, and death is short, as you should know. You who have dealt it to so many of my people, do you not remember? In Karamata, far from here. Why should I? Then, this hair on my face was like gold in the sun. Now it is like the form of an angry sea. Huh? But Abdullah rules the land now, rules even Raja Laud. You people, you did this. And you will be sorry for it, believe me. Abdullah's presence will bring Dutch rule here. You see that forest there, Duan? You think those big trees know the name of the ruler? Even a big tree may be felled by a small axe. And remember, my one-eyed friend, axes are made by white men. You will soon find that out since you've hoisted the flag of the Dutch. The farther away, the master, the easier it is for the slave. You know that, Duan. Your voice has been in our ear always. Too close. Too close. If I ever spoke to the Raja, it was for your own good. For the good of all. That is fight man's talk. That is how you talk. While you load your guns and sharpen your swords. And when you are ready, to those who are weak, you say, Obey me and be happy or die. 
You think it is only your wisdom and your virtue that are true. You are stronger than the wild beasts, but not so wise. A tiger knows when he is not hungry. Is that so? And whom did I kill here, eh? Had you come a day sooner, you would have seen an enemy die. You would have seen him die poor, blind, unhappy, with no son to dig his grave and speak of his courage. You would have seen the man that fought you in Keramata many moons ago die alone. I told you, I don't remember. He died in darkness, Tuan. Babalachi sat by his side and held his hand, but he could not see Babalachi's face. She, whom he had cursed because of the white man, was there too, and wept with covered face. The white man walked about making noises. He stared with wicked eyes, and then Babalachi was glad that the great chief Omar was blind. Babalachi dug a grave in the hut where his great chief died. Oh, she mourned to the daughter. She mourned so much that that white son of yours came to the doorway and shouted. Do you understand what I say, Tuan? Your white son... Not my son. ...came inside the hut with great anger and took the daughter by the shoulder and dragged her out. Yes, Tuan, Omar was dead and his daughter was at the feet of that white man, now Abdullah's slave. Yes. Mm. Babalachi held back his hand when he saw this, for there must not be any trouble with the white man. Abdullah has spoken and Babalachi... She must obey. You seem angry, Babalachi. I am not angry, Tuan. Why should I be? I am only a sailor and have fled your people many times. Servant of this one, protected by that one. I have given my counsel here and there for a handful of rice. Why should I be angry with a white man, even when that man destroys the grave marker of a great chief, leaving nothing but ashes? Swearing he'd burn me and her inside if we did not come out. That man is not like other white men. You know that. In fact, he's not a man at all. He's a... Not like you, eh, Tuan? Yet he is cunning, eh? He has many words to say about you. What does he say? Why should I repeat the words of one white man about another? Ugh. Babalachi shall go now. In that house, there is your white son, Tuan. I can see nothing. It's too dark. You have been looking at the fire too long. So you will see. Babalachi turns to go, then turns back. Mind the gun, Tuan. It is loaded. There's no flint in that gun. You couldn't find flint for a hundred miles. I got it from a friend who lives far away. The gun is good. It shoots straight and far. I believe it would carry from here to the door of the white man's house. Never mind your gun. Wait a little, Tuan. By morning, there will be light enough to see the man who not so many days ago said that he alone has made you less than a child in some beer. <sniffs> but it is not good to one to sit where you may be seen. Why not? The white man sleeps. It is true. But he might come out early and he has a gun. He has a gun, has he? Yes, a short one that fires many times. Like yours. Hmm. Look to one. The house, not far. Yes, I see it. Take care. Of the gun, Tuan. I have put in a double measure of powder and three slugs. You thought I came here to murder him? Speak, you filthy dog. What else, Tuan? You are a man. If you did not come to kill, then either I am a fool or you are. It seems to me that you must have had much to do with what's happened in Sambir lately, you one eyed son of a. May I lose both eyes if my words are not true? You are here amongst your enemies. He is the greatest. Abdullah could do nothing without him, and I could do nothing without Abdullah. How dare you? Go, I tell you, go. I will, but you look to that house. I'll look where I like, and you may go to hell. The islands of these seas shall sink before I, Raja Lut, serve the will of you or your people. But I will say this, I don't care what you do with them after today. As you wish, Tuan. As Babalachi heads for the old woman's hut, the captain takes several strides back the way he came. Is the canoe ready? Yes, Tuan! Wait for me with the paddle in your hands, understand? Yes, Tuan! Outside the old woman's hut... Woman! The old woman's head pops out. Matter all of our things and meet me at the boat. Huh? No! The old woman's head pops back inside. Babalachi quickly exits down the jungle path. Having meandered over to the fire pit, the captain glances around. He's taking a few cautious strides towards the house. Beware!
Beware. Who is that? The captain must backtrack a bit to see her. Over her shoulder is a comically oversized and overstuffed canvas sack. Only me, Raja Snout. <laughs> Raja, get on with you now. Get on with you, I say. Bride of the devil, that one is. Bride of the devil. He raises his hand to give the old woman a slap, but she slinks away, dragging her sack with her. The captain finds Aisa standing before the door to the house. Let me pass. I came here to talk to a man. Some have called me a man. Where is he hiding? Has he sent you? It is my fear that has sent me here. He is not afraid. He sleeps. Go and wake him, or I shall call him. He knows my voice well. Aisa falls at the captain's feet. Please, please. Stand up. I said, stand up. Reluctantly, she stands. You are Omar's daughter. So you ought to know that when men meet, a woman must be silent and obey. I am a woman, Rajalaut. Yes, but can you see my life? Can you see it? I have heard the sounds of many fights, the pop of guns and the rain of bullets. I have stared in silence at angry faces and at strong hands raised high holding sharp steel. I have seen men fall dead without a cry and I've watched the sleep of the weary and stared at shadows full of death with eyes that know nothing but watchfulness. I've faced the heartless sea, held on my lap the heads of those who died, raving from thirst and from their cold hands, took the paddle and worked so that those with me did not know that one man more was dead. What have you done, Raja Laut? So it's true. You are a woman whose heart is big enough to fill a man's breast. But still, you are a woman. And so to you, to you, I have nothing more to say. Wait. Men of my people have often spoken by the fires that you, the first on the sea, were deaf in battle to a man's cries. But to the voices of woman, of child, your ears were open. Your men have spoken true. My ears are open to you, but listen to me well. Nothing you can say will change my mind about the man who is sleeping or hiding in that house. You know nothing. I know enough. Moving towards him, she places her two hands on his shoulders. He is surprised at her audacity. How can you know? How can you? I live with him all the days, all the nights. I see his every breath, every look of his eye, every move of his lips. Even I do not understand him. Him! my life. The captain's eyes blink rapidly as she speaks close to his face. There was a time I could understand him when I knew what was in his mind better than he knew it himself. But now he is gone. Gone? Where? I am forever near him, yet alone. Her hands slip off the captain's shoulders and her arms fall by her side. So what do you want? I want, I have looked for, everywhere against men. All men. First they came, the white man, and dealt death from afar. Then he came. He came alone and sad. He came angry with his brothers, great amongst his people. Angry with those I have not seen, where men have no mercy and women no shame. He was great among them. He was great, yes? Great. I have lived by the side of brave men, of chiefs. When he came, I was the daughter of a beggar, of a man without strength or hope. He spoke to me like I was brighter than the sunshine, more delightful than the cool water of the brook. I was everything to him, everything. I saw it. I felt his eyes. I saw him tremble when I came near. When I spoke, when I touched him. Look at me. You have been young once. Look at me. Look! Turning her head, she glances fearfully at the house behind her. The eyes of the captain follow. If he hasn't heard your voice by now, he must be far away or dead. He's there. For three days he waited for you. I waited with him, watching his face, listening to his words, words he spoke in daylight, words he spoke in his sleep. What was he saying? What was he going to do? Was he afraid of you, of death? 
what was in his heart. He spoke many words, but I could not understand. I followed him everywhere, trying to catch some word that would help me understand. When I touched him, he was angry. His mind was in the land of his people, far away from me. His people? I watched him. I thought he was afraid, afraid of you. Tell me, Raja Laut, do you know the fear that comes when there is no one near? When there is no battle, no cries, no angry faces or hands with guns? The fear there is no running away from. I? I knew he would not fight you. I went away twice, twice, to make him strike at his own people. But his hands was as false as your white hearts. It struck, but killed nobody. His strength was a lie. My own people lied to me, and to him, and to meet you. You, the great. He doesn't flinch. She moves even closer. He is everything to me. My breath, my light. Go away. Forget him. He has no courage anymore. Go away and forget. There are other enemies. He was a man once. I tried, but nobody can beat you. Leave him to me and go away. You don't know what you're asking. Listen, go to your own people. Leave him. He's finished. Tell the brook not to run to the river. Tell the river not to run to the sea. But the brook and the river, they do not care. I do not care, Raja Laut. She draws even closer. Do you know what I did to my own father? My own father? Why, I'd rather have... You shall have his life. I do this not in mercy, but in punishment. What punishment? Will you take him away from me? Listen to what I have done. It is I who... Do not believe her, Captain. Standing bare-chested in the doorway is Willems. After a moment, he moves down the plankway, stopping six feet from the Captain. Do not believe... <coughs> do not believe... The captain grips the revolver in his pocket tightly. Willem's eyelids begin to flutter. Gradually, the captain's grip relaxes. Eventually, he lets it go. Staring at Willem's, the captain clenches his fist, draws back his hand, and delivers a strong blow to Willem's face, which Willem's does not resist. Defend yourself, man. Defend yourself. Willem stands passively, the sleeve of his jacket across his face. A coward. A plain old Coward, will you be a cheat to the end? The captain waits for an answer, but there is none. Willem's raised arm sinks from his face and drops by his side as he bleeds profusely from the nose. The captain attempts to move closer, but Aisa embraces him around the ankles so he cannot move. Let go. Let go. Let go. Steady, captain. Steady. Soothed by a familiar voice, the captain stands still. Tell her to let me go or I shall... Aisa. All right, captain. She's let go. As the captain steps aside, Aisa lifts herself to her knees and covers her face with her hands. The captain slowly turns and looks at Willems, who holds himself very straight, like a man who is drunk. What have you got to say for yourself? After putting a hand to his face, Willems holds it up to his eyes, then draws it down the front of his jacket, leaving a long smear of blood. That's a fine thing to do. I had too good an opinion of you. Don't you see? I could have had that son of yours killed and the whole thing burned to the ground. You wouldn't have found as much as a heap of ashes had I liked. You didn't dare, you scoundrel. <laughs> What's the use of calling me names? You're right. There's no name bad enough for you. Aisa stares at the two men, as if trying to decipher the meaning of their words. If I wanted to hurt you, I would have. I stood in the doorway long enough to pull a trigger, and you know I can shoot. You would have missed. There is such a thing as justice. You know I was a good man. You always praised me for my steadiness. You know I never stole, if that's what you were thinking. I borrowed. It was an error of judgment and I paid for it. Error of judgment. So I drank a little, played cards a little. Who doesn't? But I had principles. Yes, principles. I was never an ass. I never respected fools. I made them suffer when they dealt with me. A clever one. I kept clear of women, too. Except for, but that was Hudig's doing, not mine. Then you came along and dumped me here like a load of rubbish. Dumped me and left me with nothing to do. And damn little to hope for. At the mercy of that fat fool who suspected me of some grave misdeed. Suspected and hated me from the start. Because you befriended me. He isn't very deep, but he knows how to be disagreeable. As the months passed, I thought I would die of sheer weariness of my thoughts, of my regrets, and then... As Willem steps nearer the captain, Aisa steps nearer too. But don't you believe her? Don't you believe her? You hear me? I've been waiting for you three days and nights. I had to sleep sometime, didn't I? 
I told her to stay awake and watch for you. What has she told you? Huh? You can't believe her. You can't believe any woman. Who can tell what's inside their heads? The only thing you can know is that it isn't anything like what comes out of their mouth. They live beside you, they hate you, or they love you. They caress or torment you. They throw you over or they stick to you closer than your own skin for some awful reason of their own, which you can never know. <laughs> Look at her. Huh? Look at me. Me. Her infernal project. What's she been saying, huh? What? She begged me for your life. And for three days, she planned ambushes, looking for places I could hide and drop you with a safe shot as you walked up. I give you my word. Your word? Look at her. She took me as if I didn't belong to myself. She did. I didn't know there was more in me she could get a hold of. But she did. Me, a civilized European and clever, and her no more than a wild animal. Well, she found out something in me. She found it out and I was lost. I knew it. She tormented me. I was ready to do anything. I resisted, but I was ready. I knew it too. And that frightened me more than anything. What does he mean, Raja Laut? <laughs> Tell me what he means! I tried to do something. Take her away from these people. I went to El Maya, the biggest blind fool that's ever... Then Abdullah came and she went away. She took with her something I had to get back. I had to do it. It would have happened sooner or later. You couldn't be master here forever. You! I fought, but she goaded me to violence. To murder, even. She pushed me to it, persistently, desperately. But I woke up. I woke up, only to find myself beside a wild cat. Her father tried to kill me, and she... She would have stopped at nothing to defend her own. And when I think that it was me, me, that I hate her, tomorrow she may want my life. How can I know? She may want to kill me next. I don't want to die here. Don't you? Look at her. Always watching. Look at her eyes. They're on me when I sleep, and they're on me when I wake. They follow me like a pair of jailers. They wait till I am off my guard. Look at them. They're the eyes of a, a savage, a, a mongrel. I can't stand it. Take me away. Please, take me away. You are possessed. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it pretty? I've heard this kind of talk from you before. Take me away. Well, this time I won't do it. I won't do it. I pick you up by the waterside like a starving cat. I don't regret it. Abdullah, no doubt Hudig himself were after me. That's business. But that you should, you. Money belongs to him who's strong enough to keep it. But this, this was different. This was my life. I'm an old fool. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. I tell you, that wasn't me. Then who else? Who else? Do you ever see me, Lion Steel? Tell me that. Did you? What did you expect when you asked me to see you? You know me. You lived with me. You know what you've done. I was alone. Don't you see? I was alone in that infernal savage crowd. I was delivered into their hands. In my life, my whole life, only one man has ever cared for me. You. You asked what I expected. Something, anything, anything to take me out of this darkness. Anything to get me out of her sight. <laughs> to think that when I first laid eyes on her, it seemed as though my whole life wouldn't be enough to... But now, just look at her. I must have been mad. That's it. Mad. When I think of everything in my life, all of my past, my future, my intelligence, my work, there is nothing left but her, the cause of my ruin, and you, who cared for me, and whom I have... I have... He hides his face in his hands. When he takes them away, he appears desperate. Please, Captain, anything. A deserted island. Anywhere. I promise. I promise you. Shut up. Shut up! The captain wipes his forehead with the back of his hand. No promise of yours is any good to me. I'm going to take your conduct into my own hands. Pay attention to what I'm going to say. You are my prisoner. Willem's head nods imperceptibly, then becomes very still. You will stay here. You're not fit to be among people. You are my mistake. I shall hide you here. If I took you somewhere else, you'd go among unsuspecting men and lie and cheat and steal for a little money or... The captain glances at Aisa, then back at Willem's. I won't shoot you. That would be the safest route, but I won't. But don't expect me to forgive you. To me, you are not Willems, the man I befriended and helped through thick and thin and thought much of. You are not a human being that may be destroyed or forgiven. You're a bitter thought, something without a soul, something that must be hidden. You are my shame. You mean, I must live here? Did you ever hear me say something I didn't mean? You said you didn't want to die here. Well, you must live. The captain narrows his eyes, then shakes his head. You're alone. Nothing can help you. And nobody will. You are neither white nor brown. Your accomplices have abandoned you to me because I am still somebody to be reckoned with. You're alone, but for that woman there. You say you did this for her. Well, you have her. Willems grabs his hair with both hands. Aisa, who has been looking at Willems, turns to the captain. Is it? True, Raja Laut. Yes, he must live here. All his life, 
with you. Aisa looks at Willems, who remains very still. She then spins back around to the captain. You lie, Raja Laud! You lie like a white man! You, who Abdullah made small! You lie! Very well. As far as the rest of the world is concerned, your life is finished. You are buried here. And you think I will stay? That I will submit? There is the forest and there is the river. At one end, you'll meet Almeyer, and at the other, the sea. Take your choice. There is also a third way. Oh, I shall live. I may escape, too. Away from her. I don't care what you do, but I will tell you this. Without that woman, your life is not worth tuppence. As the captain starts to slowly make his way to the gate, Willems follows, as if led by a string. Why, Babalachi here? Even Abdullah himself? But you've no doubt thought of that. Then there is the woman. She won't go. She was right. I ought to have shot you. The captain neither stops nor looks back. But you see, you can't. There's not even that in you. Do not provoke me, Captain. The Captain turns around sharply. Provoke you? What's left in you to provoke? It's easy to talk like that when you know that in the whole world I have no other friend. Whose fault is that, eh? Whose fault? The manservant appears from the bush and joins the Captain. (sighs) Onai is gone, Captain. With the old woman. They took everything in a huge sack. (laughs) I see. They incoming, Captain. Yes. Make ready. Aye, aye, sir. The captain and the manservant make their way over to the canoe and climb into it. Resisting a strong urge to look at Willems one final time, the captain stares straight ahead. Ready? Yes, sir. Pro... proceed. We shall meet again, captain. No. The manservant begins to paddle fiercely. Let's cross river, captain! Water, let's quick over there! Aisa shakes her fist in the direction of the captain, then squats at the feet of Willems, who stands motionless. The canoe and the captain gradually disappear from view. Aisa gets up and stands beside Willems. Taking a cloth, she attempts to wipe the blood off his face, but he bats away her hand. The canoe and the captain again come into Willems' line of sight. He stares at it with increasing anxiousness. Captain! Captain! Aisa puts her hand on Willems' arm in an attempt to restrain him, but he violently shakes it off. Captain! Captain! Willems begins moving towards the river in the direction of the captain. This is all you're doing. You. No! Please, Captain, please, don't leave me here. Please, don't leave me. Willems continues to move towards the river. Feeling powerless to stop him, Aisa looks around frantically. Spying Babalachi's rifle leaning against the hut, she dashes over to it. After a brief hesitation, she snatches the rifle, turns, and stares hard after Willems. For him, I will have nothing. Nothing! Have I not been faithful? Have I not loved you? Made you happy? Made you tremble? Come back! Come back! Aisa slowly raises the rifle and points it in the direction of Willems, who has begun to wade out into the river. Forget their wicked white hearts, their angry faces. Remember only the day my skin met your skin, the day my lips met your lips. My body, your body, my spirit, your spirit. Aisa carefully cocks the rifle. Oh, my life, my heart. Go with empty hands and sweet words as you came to me. Go helpless to the river, to the great sea, to the long, long sleep that waits for you. Go. Go, my love, my precious. A strange look appears on Willem's face. Casually, he touches his fingers to his chest. Then he falls forward. Aisa drops the gun and falls to her knees. No! Hands to her face, she seems on the verge of a complete breakdown. Slowly removing her hands from her face, she carefully wipes away her tears. An extremely wide smile gradually takes over each and every part of her tear-stained face. Her two open hands lift from her sides and reach out longingly towards the quietly floating body of Willems. Come back to me, my love. Come back to me. Come back to me. (laughs) Come back to me, my love. Come back to me. (laughs) Come back to me. You've reached the end of the classic novel Outcast of the Islands by Joseph Conrad. This podplay was brought to you by Mouth, bringing classic novels to sonic life in their essence. 
Outcast of the Islands was dramatized, produced, and edited by Martin Garrison, with music by Jacob McNatt, and featuring the voice talents of Munir Adhami, David Quiqui, Brian Amolo, Lisa Graciano, Will Henry, Joanne Lichtenstein, Beau Marie, Colin W.D. McLean, Esther Payne, and Richard Turner. This production was made possible in part by contributions from Luong Dang and the Stephen J. Fajardo family. To stream or download more of our work, please visit buymouth.org.